All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Um, I'm hoping your field season is going well and you're able to get everything done. Uh, it has been uh, kind of on and off for us, but anyway, I'm glad you're able to make it today. So my name is Scotty Wells. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Agronomy and Plant Genetics. And it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce our, um, our speaker today. This is Stephen Mursky. Uh, he has a lecture as so well in front of you now. I'm gonna go over his bio quickly, but before I do that, I wanna go over a couple of ground rules on how we're gonna, this is gonna work. I know many of you uh, attended last week. Again, we're gonna do the Q&A se session after the seminar, just like we would do if we were meeting in person. So that'll be open. Please try to do it in an orderly manner. Use your hands up or you know, raise hand, lower hand thing. And then if you're dropping them in the chat box, I will facilitate those at the end and read those back to uh, Dr. Mursky and uh, he can answer those. If you got other tag in questions, just tag them in uh, in the uh, chat box. And we'll just go from there. I think, um, yeah, if there's any, I don't guess there's any questions on how we're gonna handle the questions. So we'll just, we'll just kind of go with it. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So Stephen Mursky is a research ecologist at the Sustainable Agriculture Systems Laboratory at Bellsville Agriculture Research Center, otherwise known as BARC in, in Bellsville, Bellsville, Maryland. He joined ARS in 2018 and received his BA in agroecology, uh, his master's in soil fertility and quality, and his PhD in agronomy with an emphasis on wheat ecology. Stephen takes an transdisciplinary approach to systems, a systems approach to developing precision, sustainable agriculture systems. His work includes applied and basic theoretical approaches to interactions affecting crop product production and sustainability. He works across the agricultural sector in large regional and national teams to merge precision and sustainable agriculture, the IoT and the AI and real-time data management platforms. He manages two of the cropping systems experiments that contribute to the Lower Chesapeake Bay, the LTAR, and he's the co-director of the Precision Sustainable Ag Network, uh, evaluating implications of cover crops and crop performance, uh, water and nitrogen pest dynamics. He is also the project director for the National Cover Crop Breeding Program and, the, and collaborates between USDA university nonprofit organizations, private industries and farmers, Dr. Mercy also co-leads the National Integrated Weed Management Team, co-founded the current chair of the Northeast Cover Crop Council and is working with NRCS and regional cover crop councils to provide molecular web-based decision support tools, data management platforms, and information visualization systems. Wow, Dr. Mursky, that's a lot. Um, I'm really, really thankful you're here. And full disclosure, Dr. Mursky uh, was my uh, PhD advisor. And uh, it's, um, so it's really great, great to, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sad we weren't able to do it in person, but I guess there'll be other opportunities. So with that, uh, Steve, Stephen, take it away. It's all yours. Thanks, Kai, I appreciate it. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right, perfect. All right, I'll, I will begin. Uh, was also looking forward to traveling out there and seeing everybody and coming to the department. We have a number of collaborations with the University of Minnesota. So I was just looking forward to connecting and, and seeing everybody, but uh, these are the times. So um, you know, we'll try to do this through a webinar mode. And, and this is kind of a, a, a different uh, talk uh, for me because I'm trying to merge together a number of the things that we're doing in this big team and give a, a, a presentation really more on what does it take to do coordinated science. Um, so hopefully uh, you'll, you'll kind of see that throughout this talk, it's really mostly focused around, you know, the approach to doing coordinated science and less on the insights that come out of it. But uh, if you have any further questions about these approaches, we're such a big team, there's lots of people to connect to, um, and happy to direct you to the different individuals who are leading any one effort. Um, uh, so, you know, this is pretty common these days to see these kinds of slides start a presentation, right? You know, everybody is leading off uh, uh, the, their presentations these days with the big concerns of the grand challenge of, of feeding the world and how are we going to do that and, and, and moreover, how are we going to do it in the face of all these destabilizing factors, you know, like climate change, and declining soil and water quality, you know, pests becoming resistant to the different types of control practices that we have. You know, so we have all these destabilizing factors in agriculture, um, and so we've got to feed the world and this growing population while in the face of them. Uh, and so certainly precision agriculture is being seen as, as kind of the, um, 
uh, one of the, the primary strategies to get there, right? This is site-specific management. And we've seen a lot of precision agriculture uh, adoption and, and development over the years. I'd say it's, it's, it's really rapidly increasing in adoption the last couple of years as technology's improved. And the focuses have been certainly around um, precision applications of inputs, like your crop populations, your nutrients, uh, weed management, irrigation, how do you put down uh, precision applications and have it be site specific. And while this is a big part of the solution, it certainly doesn't, um, it's not the whole solution. Sustainable agriculture is a big part of, you know, addressing these critical needs. Less from the precision perspective, but more about the adaptive and resiliency of the system. So we're really focused around merging precision and sustainable agriculture, taking the best of, of what precision technologies are out there and making our sustainable agriculture more precise so that we can improve the productivity of our systems as well as their resiliency. Uh, but you know, precision agriculture, sustainable agriculture, both of these practices are incredibly knowledge intensive, right? It takes a lot of information and data to actuate these goals. You know, so to, to build that knowledge to manage complexity, we need extensive information about climate and soil and management. And here's just a simple depiction of, of a field where, you know, we have some wet spots in the field and dry spots, and that's affecting our, our fall cover crop and spring growth. And you can see, you know, highly spatial fields means that we need to have precision management, even when using sustainable strategies like cover crops. So not just... Um, uh, the science, but it's also the networking of our science that's really important in coordinated science. So we need to bring our scientists together and we need to connect through different types of coordinated strategies from common research um, to, you know, you know cross-site, you know, collaborations to bringing together large networks. And so here's just a picture of the, of the different regional cover crop councils that have gotten uh, underway in, in some since uh, 2006, as, the, as you know, in the Midwest, others more recently. Uh, but these groups are coming together around solutions um, for sustainability goals, cover crops being the, the primary emphasis, but folks focused on those kinds of solutions or tend to be focused on a range of different sustainability goals. And so it's been a big part of our uh, agenda to merge kind of these sustainability strategies with precision agriculture, as I've mentioned. And that's kind of, oh, let's skip slide. And, and, and not just doing this through these coordinated networks, but bringing our uh, research on farm and making these farms a living laboratory. And so part of what you're gonna hear today is how to do coordinated science, how to network this science through different communities of practice, uh, but also to bring our science on farm so that we can bring together that climate, that soil, and that management to be able to provide that site-specific recommendations to growers. And so it's, this is what birthed uh, what we're calling, you know, an information ecology for precision sustainable agriculture. Uh, so an information ecology really is just bringing together the partners, the actors, like, you know, the researchers, the farmers, the ag professionals. It's conducting our science on farm and on station. Uh, it's bringing together diverse different data. It's, you know, historical data, um, current data and future data around the kinds of infrastructure that supports connectivity and real-time communication and data flow so that we can provide solutions to the growers through the form of decision support tools. And so this is kind of shows a cyclic diagram that shows us aggregating our data here from past, current, future research, putting it into our databases that you can see here. That data is informing our tools. Those tools are being used by growers or collecting data by those growers on their farm, which feeds back into the databases and creates the kinds of positive feedback loops we're looking for to, for the solutions to our growers. So I'm gonna uh, highlight um, a, a team, part of what helped form this team is a sustainable ag systems cap grant, one of those $10 million grants. Our team has a number of different grants that, and cap grants that have brought us together, uh, but the SAS cap certainly really forged kind of a more national focus, or at least the whole Eastern half of the US is, is a big partnership. Uh, and so I'm gonna highlight a lot of the key objectives in that project and beyond and walk through some of the solutions that we're developing. So one of our goals is to transform data model and tool connectivity via social and technical infrastructure. So you're gonna see a lot of that throughout this presentation. You know, how do we create the cyber infrastructure that supports and connects both the social aspects of the project and, and needs and, and the technical infrastructure to do so. 
A second objective is, is develop key technologies to improve both you know, the performance of the cover crop, to inform management, and then determine the impacts on agronomic performance and ecosystem services. And so these three sub-objectives, A, B, and C, um, you know, we, we have a lot of different sensing technologies in this collaboration that we're targeting to both assess the performance of above ground dynamics, um, both cash crop and cover crop. Um, we're feeding a lot of that data as well as destructive samples that we're taking from the field into our models um, to look at current scenarios and future climate scenarios. And all of this feeds into various different decision support tools that we're providing to growers for management. And here's just some visuals of some of these different technologies, right? So we have, we have ground deployed sensors like water sensors. Uh, we have equipment mounted sensors to monitor field dynamics. We're working with satellite imagery. Some of this technology is low cost technologies like these phenocams that we're using to develop to monitor water stress. Uh, these more expensive systems like these sensors that you're putting in the field are a little bit more costly. So, you know, we have to kind of diversify how we take measures in a field from both point estimates and things that we can distribute more greatly or the things that we can get continuous you know, spatial information on. And so that's a big part of our project is to make sense of all these different types of technology and see what resolution is needed for different applications and provide that to uh, the whole network to facilitate data collection. A lot of this uh, data then becomes part of our decision support systems. Um, and so decision support, you know, comes from, you know, expert opinion, comes from empirical data, process-based models, and even hybrids of using kind of machine learning and, and, and process-based model hybrids. But all of this goes into producing, you know, tools that can be used by researchers to ask those what-if questions, and you'll see some examples of that shortly. Um, or to go into technology transfer pathways, typical uh, in the U.S. here, through either through, you know, NRCS, our county agents, private consultants, or farmers directly using these types of tools. Uh, but we also want these tools to be available to policymakers. You know, for example, like when NRCS is making cost share recommendations to growers uh, about cover crops, we want them to have our data and our tools to help inform that process so that their recommendation systems and, and the cost share uh, associated with that has the level of site specificity that our team is generating. So let me give a little bit of more specifics here, right? You know, there's a difference between what a decision support tool is and a model. You know, for example, we're developing lots of models, models on how cover crops decompose and release nutrients, or modeling, you know, developing process-based models around corn, soybeans, and cotton, and cover crop growth and development. We're working with other like field scale level models like DMDC that are doing full field assessments of greenhouse gases and carbon flows. Um, we are developing, you know, water models, uh, you know, and using the existing ones, as well as developing AI approaches um, for modeling a lot of these things and also doing yield and stability analysis. So all of these types of, of models, when you put interfaces on them, they can be developed into various different types of decision support tools. And these are just a, some of the decision support tools that we're developing. Part of that effort is taking models and building them into tools, you know, is, is obviously is what, are the, what is developing the data that goes into all of that. And, and so, you know, we have like on-farm research, we have common experiments, we have historical data, and some of this is destructive, and some of this is from sensing technology, all feeding into these, um, these algorithms that we're developing. But we're also developing adaptive management modules, and to do that, we need real-time weather information. And these, these types of uh, data is not generally uh, readily available in the public sector. There's been a lot of private sector tools built that are serving various different enterprises, but you know, aggregating this public data like NOAA and Sergo, they all require APIs. So we've been making use of some of the Sergo and soil APIs as well as we constructed our own weather API to aggregate that data to be able to make our different decision support tools more adaptive. And so here's just an example of one of our approaches to, to scale up from a process-based model. I thought this is an important uh, description of, of some of the work that the team is doing, right? So as I mentioned earlier, we're developing ways of aggregating this, this climate information or soils information and feeding that into our tools. Um, and our landscape modelers are asking questions about land use and when they can um, aggregate the different land use by modeling units, that then we can basically assert those models onto those modeling units. 
And so in this case, it could be based on a commodity, it could be based on a soil types, uh, various different land use uh, features, all of that can be used to delineate specific modeling units for us that could be a farmer's field for all the fields that we're monitoring. Um, so that data then through Python interface is, is um, taking that weather data, putting in a series of these input variables, using these process paced models and developing a range of output uh, variables that we can then apply um, at the county level, uh, various different geospatial recommendation systems or prediction systems. So here's a historical uh, data set. I'm sorry, it looks like this slide got a little cut off. Um, but this is a historical work by um, uh, David Fleischer and, and Dennis Timmum, two of the modelers in our group, um, where they did this for the Northeast, looking at um, irrigated and non-irrigated land. And on the left is under current climate conditions, and on the right is under future climate scenarios. And, um, and you can see then they looked at, again, above the top is water limited, so non-irrigated and non-limited is irrigated systems. So these are the types of approaches that we'll be taking in our modeling enterprises when I described earlier about these what-if questions. We're also, as I mentioned, developing a suite of these decision tools. And here's just a visual uh, GIF of one of the tools that is actually just about to go live. This is a species selection tool for cover crops uh, developed by the Northeast Cover Crop Council in partnership with a number of other uh, labs uh, and the councils and the Ag Informatics Group at Purdue. So um, as I... I'm going to transition now into objective three, where uh, we're talking about deploying key technologies with cover crops to assess the abiotic and biotic factors affecting crop performance. So this is now actual field experiments that we have in, you know, going out across this network. Uh, we have two common experiments. I'm just highlighting one of them right now, currently in place. Um, and so you can see by the scale of this project, we'll have, you know, 45 site years of data for this one common experiment looking at the nitrogen contributions of cover crops and the immobilization of those cover crops you know, on nitrogen as well um, in, in you know, 15 locations throughout the eastern half of the US. So we have a number of these different common experiments, as I mentioned, in place. Uh, but, and we also have an on-farm network that we're coordinating. And the on-farm network is really putting all of the different um, technology and, and protocols that we develop on station and bringing it out to the farm, but doing it in a way that's sufficiently light and tight enough so that we can deploy technologies that are manageable, right? You have less infrastructure and less resources on farm, so you need to be able to have technologies that best match um, what you're trying to, you know, and protocols best match what you're trying to measure out on the farm. So a big part of doing this on farm is allows us to, you know, get more information about the spatial complexity of management, right? And how that drives you know, both the performance of the cover crop and the subsequent cash crop. So we're looking at, you know, insects and disease and slugs and water and nitrogen and weeds all on these farms, developing lots of real-time data collection systems and feeding that into our databases. So here's just a little bit of the trajectory of our on-farm network. So we started a bit small. We were just an uh, uh, NRCS uh, SIG grant that got us going in the East Coast, uh, some select farms, and for a number of years we were um, deploying some of these technologies. And then in um, 2019, we got a water cap grant that really greatly expanded uh, the number of farms that we can do this on. And more recently, we got a SAS cap grant that, you know, continue to expand the number of farms that we're on. And we even got a more, another recent uh, grant that put another 30, 40 uh, farms on the map and we continue to expand uh, the size of this network. And so this allows us to move, you know, away from kind of place-based research, which is just single experimental stations. Uh, you know, even our 15 site, you know, common experiment research, that's 15 sites, you know, one site per, you know, state, you know, 15 states in the country. That's really limited on, on the diversity of climate and soil and management regimes that, you know, farmers are experiencing. And so for us to be able to make those site specific recommendations, we think this is a key part of the solutions for the future. And here's just some visuals of what you know, our farmer networks look like. So these green circles are, represent research stations that are key partners in this network thus far. And these uh, dots represent some of the farmers' fields that we're on. And you can see here just how we're deploying some of these technologies. And so we have these big strips of cover crop and no cover crop. 
And, and actually, the, the management practice is cover crop. We're not looking to learn how to use cover crops. We're working with seasoned cover croppers and taking their uh, a strip of their field out of production, out of cover crop for that season, so we can see what is the short-term implications of not cover cropping on you know short-term economic dynamics like water, nitrogen, weeds, insects, slugs, and such. Uh, and then we are. Um, Obviously, uh, transforming this knowledge and delivery to various different outreach uh, efforts. Uh, so in the, both in the design of our technologies, in the training of the next generation of, of scientists, and, and through the uh, traditional uh, pipelines of extension and outreach. And here's just a, a shout out to the education team that's developing new course curriculum around cover crops, and sustainable agriculture. Um, and so this is going to be a new class that is going to go live shortly and is going to be part of the curriculum that a lot of these different faculty are offering you know, years to come. <clears throat> Lastly, we, you know, a big part of our effort is integrating with social scientists. You know, they're a key part of everything that we're doing, both from the, de the design of this uh, research projects to um, working closely with farmers and consulting, you know, both our theory of change and how we're going to actuate that and whether or not our practices are resulting in such. Um, and, and so here's a um, a little bit more detailed schematic from our social scientists that I know I'm going to do a terrible job at describing. Uh, but historically, you know, early grants focused on looking at, you know, the f farmer focused social science efforts, you know, you know, behavior, perceptions versus realities amongst growers, what drives decision making, um, and, and, and how can we influence those decision making. The uh, most recent grant is really focusing on, you know, our structure as a team and how we collaborate and, you know, and how we work together and looking at, you know, from the very beginning in this, the framing of our team building activities to how we develop solutions, the social scientists are intertwined in every step of the way and both so that we can best understand, are we having the effects that we would like to have and where we need to adjust our approach. So now um, I've kind of introduced the team and, and some of our focus areas. Um, so like I'd like to just you know, spend the rest of this talk talking about um, how do you do coordinated science? It's incredibly exhausting and time consuming to work in these large groups, right? I mean, it's so much more extra effort to, um, to do that. Um, and so what, what does it take to do that? And, and why do we do that? You know, and, and, and what are the synergies that come from doing that is what I'm gonna kind of focus on now. Uh, you know, I think that for me, what the key aspect here is that, you know, most of us are doing a lot of science that exists in a bubble, right? We have two-year projects, three-year projects with our master's and our PhD students. And all of that data goes and lives in, in isolation of each other. And so, you know, we might be doing our science in one year, it's the wettest year in recorded history, and the next year it was the driest year in recorded history. And that pretty much happens pretty regularly these days, right? So then what do we say about the results from that two-year study or that three-year study? Well, it's hard to say a lot because that data exists in a bubble, it's at a, it's, you know, a single site, or maybe it's a couple of sites. And so it makes it really challenging to make a lot of inference about that data. And so we're trying to break down those data silos, bring um, our science together and coordinate how we execute. So here I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch to a live demo here. So this is um, our team portal. So you come into our team portal uh, of, of uh, Precision Sustainable Ag is the website. And then once you're in this team, then you can you have a password you can come into the team portal and you can see how we organize organize ourselves here this is incredibly important for doing coordinated science is that people have access to what we're doing when we're doing it in real time and all of the information they need to get their questions answered so you know we have like a organizational chart that takes them down to who just who's the the leadership of the team and how are we um, structure, you know, to who is the support staff of this team and, and contact information to who are the various team leads from the common experiments to the different, you know, thematic leads like weeds or insects, the data flow all the way down to modeling and, and so on. So this gives people access across the team. We have calendars continuously updated so people know when different meetings are occurring depending on the month of the year. Um, we have all of our protocols embedded within here. So this, we use uh, Google uh, Drive as the back end here to this, but all of these link to those different products and give real time access to protocol. So if there's a change in the protocol, everybody has access to that protocol in real time.
in addition, we're really key on um, storing all of what we do and keep making it accessible from both the analysis and from the coding and the programming side of all the different uh, um, offerings of our cyber infrastructure that we've developed, right? So here's our GitHub account, and you can see here uh, through our repositories, you know, that, why is this? Oh, I know what's going on. I didn't switch back to that. Yeah, here's our uh, GitHub account. You can see that, you know, we're quite active in all these different repositories about, and this is where we provide all of the code. So we're open access to all the different solutions we're building so folks can grow and learn from what we've done and, and can add on to that. So I just went into like one of our databases here. You can see just going under the wiki, you can see tremendous detailed information all around the structure of our database, what is in our database, you know, folks can see how our schemas are structured so that they can replicate this and use this information, uh, to, you know, but, or build on this. Or if we have a PhD or a postdoc student working on this and they're developing some of this and then they leave to go on, we are constantly, you know, keeping track of that information and in, in here so that we don't lose access to this. And so it creates a transparency as well as an accountability for the network. All right. Go back to my presentation. Now looking at the uh, life cycle of our data, you can see here that I've kind of broke apart that earlier schematic and you can see that we have our cover crop research going on and our on-farm research and that's all fitting into our databases. And those databases then are being used to build our decision tools and to inform you know, this community of practice, right? So we're gonna walk through some of the way we deal with the data as the earlier part of this presentation you know, just talking about how we deal with communication. So now we're talking about the data. So when we're developing a protocol, first and foremost, to, make, to create standards around our data and, and the acquisition of that data and the aggregation and management of that data, we have like kind of a three-phase approach. You know, we're really trying to move away as much as possible from paper. We just want that as much as possible folks to be working in, um, uh, you know, in, in the, on software that allows for real-time um, data entry um, and, and, and access across the network. So an early protocol that's less mature, we would use something like Google Sheets that's formatted for many users. So this is a nimble product that allows us to make changes, right? You're going out the new protocol, you might need to change, you know, maybe we're studying three weeds, maybe we're studying 10 weeds, you know, how you make adjustments to that spreadsheet, you need that nimbleness to do that. And so Google Sheets is good for that. But once we start developing a mature protocol where we know exactly what we want to collect and how we want to collect it, that's when we start to shift to web-based applications like Kobo, which I'll highlight in a second. And then lastly, once we develop these mature protocols and, we, and, and, and all of this data is ingested into our databases, it allows for automation both from an analysis and a visualization standpoint. And I'll present a little bit on that shortly. So here's just a simple Kobo. So this is a tablet. You know, everybody in our network gets a tablet and we are preloading pre the software and we have the ability to update that software and modify the software on that tablet so that we can maintain uh, the uh, continuity. And so here's just a simple protocol on harvesting uh, cover crop biomass and then monitoring decomposition kinetics. You'd think that that would be the easiest thing in the world to standardize, but it turns out that everybody does things quite a bit differently. And so you need things like this to create standards. So if you're new to our network, you know, or new to this protocol, and you say yes, you automatically are queued to a video. And this video walks you through precisely how do you do um, a biomass uh, collection and deploy your litter bags for cover crop decomposition. And we make videos for everything, anywhere from deploying water sensors to, um, you, to doing analysis, um, to using these Kobo sheet forms, everything we're developing, we're developing these types of video tutorials so that everybody has that ability to get up to speed rapidly. So then, you know, this requires some farm codes that we automatically generate that, you know, based on um, um, the, uh, the initials of the farmer. And then you can see here it links to uh, geo reference locations. Um, we can get, get some metadata asking about kind of their termination and their management that feeds into the metadata. Uh, and then, you know, little things like, was it drilled or was that cover crop broadcasted? What's the percent legumes? If it was drilled, what was the row spacing? Because all of that is going to drive 
how you take a biomass sample. And then we provide automated calculations on the biomass sample. How do you divvy up that biomass sample to make your different litter bags here based on these fresh weights. And so we automate those calculations so that we allow for no mistakes in the, in the execution of this um, protocol. All right. So that's just, you know, around um, the, the example of a, a protocol execution for um, data acquisition um, in the on-farm network with these cover crop litter bags. I want to show you another product that we've generated that helps create standards. So when you're enlisting in a farmer and you're enrolling them into your network, you need to be able to get information about that farmer and be able to put that into the database so it's stored there and that we can access that at any time. And so this is just a little application that we built that everybody has access to. So when they're enrolling a new farmer, it asks information about the year, their affiliation, and, you know, is this a new grower? Is this an existing grower? Um, and then things like um, if it was uh, an existing grower, then that you're not going to have to continue to fill in that information. You have access to that and you can select on that individual. So, and then it also generates this three-digit identifier, which I mentioned earlier, which is key for linking up your data throughout the database. All right. Um, there we go. Yeah. So in all of this work that we do on farm, uh, we're very focused around putting these IoT systems everywhere. It's essential for collection of lots of information really inexpensively across diverse different, you know, climate and soil management regimes and we can aggregate that really readily. Um, so we're you know, big proponents of developing any kinds of IoT systems that we can use for monitoring on farm. And that really is what permits that real-time data acquisition, aggregation, analytics, and visualization. And so I've talked a fair bit about acquisition and aggregation. I'm gonna talk a little, well, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about aggregation and then highlight some analytics and visualization. So I can't emphasize enough the power of having a well-structured database, right? We're collecting so many diverse data streams. As those of you know, you know, we're just starting to get flooded with tons and tons of data. How we deal with all that data and, you know, is really the challenge now, right? And, and being able to make all of that data machine readable and be able to, you know, you know, have actions based on that data is so critical, right? And so that's part of what a well-structured database allows you to do. Um, so you can see here we've got, you know, weather data coming in, web applications, um, ground deployed sensors, farmer yield monitors, various different destructive samplings, as well as, you know, um, equipment mounted sensors to satellite imagery. All of this is feeding into our database, and that requires a fair bit um, of work to both on the, the quality control side and, and the vetting of technology. And so we had put a lot of infrastructure in place through all of those steps to ensure that the data is good, that it's coming in, that folks are not wasting their time with the technologies that we're using. And so because of that, we've developed a kind of a three tier system, what we call alpha testing, beta testing, and available to all users. So alpha testing is you know, new technologies that have not been broadly de uh, deployed. They have a lot of quirks and problems where it's some new you know, open source technologies that we're developing. And so that, you know, we don't want our collaborators to develop fatigue with new technology. Not everybody is tech centric or excited to uh, play with the new toy. You know, a lot of folks just want something that works right out of the box is ready to go. And if it's not ready to go, that is going to create a lot of frustration and fatigue. And so we want to make sure to avoid that. So to do that, we have the alpha testing phase, which is where we're really at a very small knit group of folks uh, that we are testing in, in, in this technology for multiple years. Once we feel like it's, it's, it's starting to mature, we beta test across a larger network, both of, you know, still folks who are, are advanced users, but, but uh, have not been playing with that technology for the last couple of years, so we can work out continuous uh, kinks in the technology. Once something is really robust, that's when it goes out and is available to all users. So let's, you know, pick an example of our, our uh, water sensor network, right? We, we have put an enormous amount of effort in the last five years into monitoring water dynamics and, you know, continuously on farm, developing low cost open source technologies to do so. Uh, and, and we've been very successful, but it's been a real process to develop this workflow, right? So here you can see we have two replicates. We have a bare 
ground. We have with cover crop, we have nodes connected to these different sensor networks, and that's feeding into a gateway, which then shoots it off into the cloud. And so this is kind of our workflow. Uh, and, and you can see here on one in one given farm what you know, these litter bags I was mentioning earlier, or these wi wireless sensors uh, look like. Now, because there's always a lot of problems with this, this requires us to develop tools for technicians and what we're calling the data shepherds. So now let me, so we developed, um, uh, a tech dashboard. So this is a tech dashboard that we've developed that allows, you know, our technicians and our data shepherds to be able to get a sense of what's working, what's not working and to troubleshoot. So individual technicians are monitoring what's going on at their sites. Our data shepherds are responsible for specific protocols like water sensors or cover crop decomp. And they're looking across the network and have a number of quality control measures in place. Check for that. So I mentioned earlier that site enrollment. I'm not gonna do that again here, but you can, you can this is where that was. Um, oops, back out of there. So now under the water sensors, you can see these different years we've had this in place. You can go into 2020, we can click on this farm and here it's giving us continuous readings of the voltage this, of, the, of the sensors that are out there. So right away, we know if a sensor is working, we don't have to drive out to the farm. It's super exhausting to install something and not be able to test right away, is it working live, right? So we have all that kind of infrastructure in place. And then our data shepherds can take a deeper look, right? Or our technicians, um, and they can go in and they can click on here and, and highlight an area and they can look at a specific rain events and see how well um, the sensors are working. Does that match what is expected? Is there a problem with one of our sensors? They can select different depths in the profile and just look at those depths. They can reset this back to the, the reset the zoom. Um, they can even um, print this out or download this. And so this is just a great way for everyone across the network to be monitoring their own practice, as well as those that we've empowered from the data shepherd side to track other uh, across the network for a given measurement. Here's an example, another one of these uh, solutions on our uh, tech dashboard is just easy real-time data monitoring, right? So this lets us know just when was the last time a sensor took data. It's simple. It's got a simple, you know, uh, uh, um, color coordination system here to, deploy, to detect, you know, when it, uh, was the last reading, whether it was within a one hour or four hours, 36 hours, but just quick user-friendly tools to help our technicians um, make sure that everything is working. So all of that kinds of efforts then permits the data visualization and automation, right? So making sure you have the data standards, making sure you have good communication across the team, enabling all of that data to be aggregated and, and structured so that you can then provide visualizations back to growers and automate analysis is the key goal here. And so part of that for us includes, you know, using Jupyter Notebooks. And a goal of ours is to be able to use Jupyter Notebooks uh, in the cloud so that we can track any kinds of activities. So here's an example of using Jupyter Notebooks um, where they're looking at, um, here's, Here's our, I'm here, I'm sorry, here it is. They're going into our uh, database here. They've got, they've structured out a lot of the details around how to, what, what they are doing with these models and how they're deploying these, these analysis. And you can see here, they've automated um, putting points down on every time a farm comes into the network. So these are all just in a given snapshot in time when a farmer entered the network. And so this code automates this and allows folks to understand how we built that automation. Same we can do here is like, we really wanna make sure that we're capturing diverse amounts of soil types. So we can automate this figure. So every time that, that you run this code, you basically know our, you can see where we are in this response surface of the different soil types that we're monitoring and are we capturing that diversity of, of um, soil types that we want in this network. Um, and, and, um, here, you're, what you're seeing is um, just some of the data visualization that we provide to our growers. Now, here's like a dashboard that's integrating their information saying, hey, this is how much cover crop biomass you produced as it relates to others in your region. This is just a snapshot of some of the farms in the last couple of years, right? So you can see here, oh, 
this is what my biomass is. You can get the farmers competing with each other, right? They don't know who each other is, right? That this is all anonymous. We don't allow uh, any of that data. We have all sorts of privacy and security measures in place to uh, regulate access to this data and, and um, identifiers to the farmer. But here they can see how other farmers in a given region might be producing. Um, this gives them information about their crop yields and how it relates across the region and information about their water uh, dynamics in real time. And so this also is being developed so that they can see, you know, what is the value of cover cropping? Is it representing a net increase in water infiltration and storage or is it a net negative? And so this is also partly co-learning tools. But also building these, uh, these databases and, and these automated analysis allow us to continuously populate and, and develop uh, models and tools, right? So here is the decomposition kinetics of cover crops. And this is just, you know, aggregated across a select number of the states. And this is um, here, what you're looking at is, uh, you know, on the x-axis here, the rainfall, rainy days, humidity measures, air temperatures, and this is the K value, which represents the decomposition rate. So in an exponential decay function, this is your decay rate. And so this allows us to look at carbon and nitrogen dynamics on these farms. And then as data and it goes into the database, it's going to automate this analysis and adjust these K values. Um, further synergies that come out of this type, so let me just take a look at time here. So we've got about um, almost 18 minutes left. All right, good. So part of uh, developing these automated analysis and, and um, different IoT systems is, is that it permits the use of new analysis approaches like machine learning and AI, which really is greatly in enhancing our ability to detect dynamics and changes in the landscape, whether that's you know, weeds and whether it's detecting disease or water stress. Uh, these types of approaches permit that, but they're incredibly data intensive. Like I mentioned earlier, everything we're doing is, requires a lot of data. This particularly does. So this is a good match for doing coordinated science, but not everybody in the network is going to be able to deploy high-tech technologies, right? So that's partly why we develop low-tech and high-tech solutions. Here you can see just a simple plastic PVC frame that we put these QR codes in, and then this little camera here, and this camera is taking pictures you know, of quadrats in the field that we can capture images of weeds and crops. And these QR codes allow us to automate that, you know, assign, you know assigning an, an identifier to that data and put it into our database for subsequent you know, processing for machine learning or AI applications. Other approaches here, these lower cost methods here, we're developing phenocams that are just taking simple pictures continuously um, of crops. And this is determining when a corn leaf curls its leaf or when a soybean um, um, curls its leaf, right? And so you can see here on um, some of those images where a soybean is undergoing drought stress. These simple cheap cameras allow us to be able to capture, you know, um, information about dynamics on farms that our point sensors, like those water sensors, are not good at doing, right? Because they're only getting individual points. This allows us to integrate larger areas, but moreover, they're super cheap and we can put them over wider areas across the landscape. So this is part of the synergies that come from working across these networks is, you know, we have computer scientists and engineers and um, data scientists all collaborating so that we can develop high-tech and low-tech solutions and high-cost and low-cost solutions. And here's just some of the examples of what we're doing with weeds. Um, so in that, in that earlier one was, it was, a, was a lower tech solution. Here we're using a GoPro cameras and developing what we're calling structure for motion approaches, where we're actually just creating point clouds as we go across a field to monitor um, and, and develop um, algorithms that estimate biomass of the weeds that are out there. So our hope is in a year, we can basically just distribute GoPros to the network and they can walk across the field with that GoPro and they can automate collecting weed biomass data in their field. So here's a smaller group of folks developing a technology that then gets used by you know, the larger network. And that types of solutions that we develop for the network, it builds all sorts of other synergies. We're looking at other camera systems that permit this in a cheaper way and, and other technologies that, that are using the same principles or similar that can then be used in greenhouses for high throughput phenotyping. So all of these kind of create connectivity and synergies when you work in these coordinated networks. And I'll just end with this last 
example is that, that, but when we wanna do this, right? When we wanna detect these weeds or map them and manage them, um, as I mentioned, we, we have to assume that not everybody in the network is going to be able to work with all the technologies. And so both the cost and the technical skill level matters, but then it's also access to being able to um, capture these images and process them and make them machine readable. And so we, for example, developed a simple web application where um, you know, on, a, on, a, on, a, on your phone, you can take an image of a weed and it provides some of the metadata and then goes right into the you know, database that can be used for subsequent you know, machine learning applications. So all kind of just trying to emphasize the point that, that all of this technology, all of these solutions are complex. Much of them requires a lot of um, technology uh, skill levels or, or resources. Um, and so working across networks like what we're doing allows us to concentrate efforts uh, that provides solutions to the greater network so that we can get at the larger goal. And the larger goal is aggregating information about climate, soil, and management, and putting that all together so we can provide you know, site-specific solutions to growers. Well, thank you, uh, Stephen. That was amazing. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you. Uh, and... Um, yeah, wow, it was really, really good. There's a lot of content here. Um, we got some time for some q and I, I hope that there's some questions coming up. I see one already from Nick Anders. Uh, if you don't mind, Nick, why don't you, um, why don't you go ahead and open your mic up and ask? Or it um, seems because like you have two questions here for Dr. Mursky. Or maybe they don't have permission to do it. I guess I can just go ahead and read it off. Uh, so a question from Nick, Ander, uh, Nick uh, Andrews is, uh, I'm interested in your dash, dashboard for our farm info. Uh, I found it challenging to collect field management history info from farms and use that info in an analysis of results. Can you discuss this? And he also followed up with a question I'm sure many of us have as well, how to get access to the PSA. So the first question is really kind of how you do it. How are you getting that data? Um, and being able to do the analysis. I, I know you gave some examples of that, so uh, maybe you can elaborate a bit on that. And then I guess you could provide us the password information to anyone who's interested afterwards. Sure, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, I suspect there's um, multiple, oh, here I found my, oh, it was like hiding on me, the, the, the chat box, and now I found it so I can see this too. Um, uh, you know, I'm assuming that this question is both about just you know the data acquisition side but also the privacy and security side is my impression is so I'll, I'll kind of speak about both you know so we like I said the evolution of, of our team has really been you know kill paper right if someone on the network is using paper we, we see it as a personal failure in, in our efforts to eliminate paper you know and, I, and I'm, I'm being obviously a, 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 a you know a little bit uh, um, uh, humorous here, but the point is, is that we don't want folks using paper. When people are using paper, things get lost. And so that's part of why we develop these kinds of web-based applications that standardize that. You know, so for us, what is the data that we need is going to be relevant to the questions we're asking. So what we ask of farmers is specific to the research questions we're asked, you know, that we're, you know, our research objectives. And so, uh, you know, I certainly keep, you know, be happy to share what um, the kinds of questions that we're asking our growers. A lot of it is about their management history and their inputs and such. Uh, and, and, you know, we're also just in small, you know, portion, <clears throat> in small portion, excuse me. <clears throat> we're just in small portions of, the, of a given field. So we're not collecting kind of whole farm management information. We're collecting information about a given field. So farmers tend to be less concerned about that. Um, two is that, you know, we're not sharing any of their data uh, with any specific identifiers, right? So we're providing that only in aggregate. Um, so that's a key part of this. And we've all, we have an entire committee called the Privacy Committee. It's their whole job is committed towards um, addressing these concerns. And that includes agronomists, social scientists, computer scientists, data scientists, all collaborating around um, coming up with uh, an understanding about how we're engaging both the growers, how we engage grower data, and how we engage the private sector with that data. And in fact, we just submitted a publication uh, to a journal that outlines all of those um, 
understandings. And so you can expect to see, I'd say in the next couple of months or maybe three, four months, that paper go out that you can get more details about how we're handling uh, privacy and security issues. <clears throat> As far as access to our network, you know, we're an inclusive group, so we're, we're pretty wide open to letting folks involved uh, into the network. So anybody who wants to kind of participate PSA, please don't hesitate to, um, to contact uh, me directly and we'll you know, see how we, ways that we can connect. I mean, obviously, everything that we do requires resources, and so some things require very little upfront cost from an individual to participate and some of it requires more and so you know we're actively writing grants all the time with lots of collaborators and private partners to help you expand and connect and and make these resources available to everybody there's some other questions here from um i guess you if you want to read them off or i can read them off to you it's in the chat box here from sharon I can just uh, what types of uh, soil information are you collecting in terms of traditional pedological information and more recently uh, dynamic soil properties? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I should be able to have it all to memory, but I'm not sure I do. Uh, we're certainly uh, capturing things like soil texture and bulk density uh, on these farms. Uh, and, you know, depending on the metrics, um, you know, we're developing water infiltration and storage um, you know, analysis on these farms and on our uh, research stations. And so, you know, by putting in depth structured soil sensors, we're not just trying to develop budgets, but moreover, looking at rainfall events. You know, if there was a high intensity rainfall, low intensity rainfall for duration, um, we're capturing how that affects water infiltration and storage over time. So certainly a lot around water dynamics. And then we're um, engaging um, Sergo and bringing in, a, you know, that the, the kinds of data that are coming out of Sergo into our databases as well for our analysis. And then our process-based modelers, they often require uh, more uh, soils data because they're developing you know, these hydrological models that are dealing with a lot of different soil processes. And so they're capturing a fair bit of that off of Sergo, as mentioned. And we do take um, some soil cores from each of these farms. Uh, but we are limited in what we can do. I, I'd say that, you know, a lot of that soil analysis tends to be some of the more expensive side. And so we're not capturing a lot of different so soil parameters. Yeah, I, I have a question. I, I, I really like the, the standardization across this network. It's just amazing. That way you have the, the models and the outcomes or, or you feel confident in those outcomes. Uh, my question as your program expands to include those 250 farms in the next wave, uh, which is amazing, um, how do you foresee the data visualizations shaping policy there in DC to actually drive these adoptions of these technologies? Uh, you know, sometimes these technologies work really well, and, and, I, and I know you and I have seen this in our own, you know, year-to-year -year research, and I think you mentioned that. Um, so how, so where's that step? I know you had a lot of social science uh, uh, work in here, but how is that being leveraged to really impact um, ad adoption? I think as we deal with more of the climate uncertainty that you showed on your second slide. Yeah, thank you. I stepped away for a second because family members are coming home and making lots of noise. <laughs> so just hope you shut some doors. Um, that's a great question, uh, Scotty. You know, um, there's a lot to say to that. Um, so I'll try to capture some of it at least. Um, first and foremost, you know, we're all of, we're pretty committed to open uh, source, open access, both from the data side as well as the tool development side. So we hope to see more and more folks, you know, use and deploy the systems that we're generating, right? And, and, and we've made a lot of progress in the last couple of years. Uh, I expect to see, you know, tr you know, really exponential progress in the next couple of years. So I think a lot of these types of solutions are gonna be really readily available, both from the decision tools uh, and the different technology that we're developing. I mean, I, you know, as someone who came out of a weed science program, just the thought of having a simple camera that can be, you know, walked across a plot and capture, you know, spatial information about weed performance is just mind blowing to me. It would transform, you know, what we can do in weed science. So I think a lot of these technologies that we're working on, a lot of other folks are working on it too. So 
part of making it open source and open access is that it's interfacing with other groups who are working on these key issues too. We learn from each other, we share, we have different, you know, uh, workshopping sessions. It's really a, about that community of practice, I think, that really makes the difference is that, that sharing. But we're also really part, you know, we're really um, engaging the uh, private sector quite a bit from national private on-farm networks like Soil Health Partnership, Practical Farmers of Iowa, Indigo Ag, uh, you know, um, the, oh, these are just some of the farming uh, groups that we're working with that um, are starting to integrate some of the IoT systems that we're using for on-farm um, monitoring that would just greatly increase the amount of data that we can collect as a whole and that's being used by those networks. And certainly um, those folks have a, a strong connection to the farming community and it helps to shape the narrative around sustainability and precision and how uh, these practices or what practices are best. I think it's important to remember that there is not a one size fits all model, right? This idea that cover crops are, uh, are, are the key to sustainability. No, not at all. Cover crops are just one of the tools in the tool belt. It's the tool that we've had a lot of traction on that we're very motivated around, but we're motivated around lots of precision sustainable ag solutions. We don't expect the benefits and services that cover crops to provide uh, in Maryland to be the same as Minnesota. And so being able to break apart that response uh, surface of, of climate soil management and what are the drivers of a given region, uh, we're gonna then be able to accentuate uh, why one might wanna use a cover crop in Minnesota versus in uh, Maryland and where are the economic trade-offs and where are the management trade-offs and let farmers certainly be the ultimate deciders of what, you know, what are their top objectives are. Uh, but then we are, as we work with other private companies and technology companies, a lot of those folks, if they're starting to uh, collaborate with us and, and make use of our tools and our data and, 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 make, and embed some of the decision tools that we're developing in their recommendation systems, we know from extension, and I, should, I know you know this well, Scott, you know, is that, that, that the private sector is, is a huge you know, player in, in extension and outreach and, and awareness about new practice. And so we want them to have our data. We want yeah, them to so Stephen, I guess I've missed, I, 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 I want to pause there because um, sure. I guess I want you to take it one layer higher than, I'm curious like how all of this comes together. Because your team has thought through so many things, which is evident in the short amount of time we've given you to speak about. Where's the big lever? Is it going, because you're talking about you have private, we have some public entities um, and, uh, where are the levers going to come? Is it just from the models themselves showing the risk mitigation? Or is there a much bigger scope thinking about, you know, adjusting the farm bill or actually engaging with the legislatures for a federal response? Sure. Well, I yeah, understand sure. everything else you're talking about, and I totally jive with it. I'm curious about the big lever. Like, how yeah. is all of those four or five caps that you have there working toward this big goal, if that well, is the goal? As an ARS scientist, you know, as you know, I'm, I can't certainly directly inform policy or make policy recommendations. So uh, certainly folks across this network, uh, some of the partners can do that and are doing that, right? Like, so we were, we are partnering with the National Wildlife Federation and part of the collaboration with the National Wildlife Federation is they're taking our data and our recommendation systems and commuting, communicating directly with RMA. And RMA, who's certainly a big driver on the adoption of a practice based on crop insurance, that's certainly them having access to our data and our recommendation systems is certainly going to influence their practice. And, and so making that data available to the folks who do make those decisions is, is, I guess, the key, right? So we're developing in collaboration with NRCS a lot of these decision support tools. These tools are going to be ingested by energy, NRCS and service as tools that they provide you know, national scope, but site-specific recommendations. Well, NRCS also makes cost share programs and, and subsidizes different practice, right? If they have our data and our tools, that means that they're getting the most current up-to-date information to inform that practice and the degree of cost share. So I, I guess that would be the, the, the closest that I'd come to discussing you know, policy recommendations. Thank you, Stephen. We have a couple other questions here. Um, uh, First of all, I guess you can read them off of the, uh, the chat here. Um, one of them is a question about data security around the Google Suite. I, I, I recall from your slides, you're using the Google Suite in the early alpha stages, and then you're moving to other platforms. 
So I guess the question is, did you use Google Suite uh, for all of this data? And uh, what are the security and uh, uh, usability for the team with using this program or the, the Google platform? Because that's something that's very common at the U as well. Sure. I mean, most of our data is ending up in Postgres, right? So it's ending up in databases that we have all sorts of administrative keys on. Very few people have access to the data entirety. You know, lots of people just have access to their individual data that they're collecting. And so there are all sorts of controls from the Postgres uh, database side. Uh, early on, when a protocol is immature, when we're, we're using kind of um, some of the Google products, like Google Sheets really is the main one, right? Um, Google Sheets is, is what we're using for a lot of immature protocols, mostly on the common experiments that's being used. So stuff that's on the research station where we have a coordinated project where it's still young in the developmental stages. Mm -hmm. Anything that goes out on farm is pretty much going to be generally considered a mature protocol and it's feeding into the um, Postgres database, which as I mentioned, has a suite of different um, security and admin controls. Excellent. I got another question here that came up and uh, this is uh, from uh, Axel in our department. He was wondering what type of soil moisture probes do you use and how do you deal with the spatial variability of the soil moisture? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so early on, uh, Harry Schomburg in our lab, the Sustainable Ag Systems Lab, um, kind of pioneered development of the open source kind of gateway node system, working with a Klima's uh, water sensors. <clears throat> you know, we don't build sensors. We're not a hardware company, right? And so uh, we made use of the uh, Klima water sensors and then built out kind of this open uh, source uh, gateway and node system, which recently Aclima has picked up and, and developed kind of their own version of that and, and now is providing those types of uh, solutions, you know, uh, retail. Uh, so we continue to use the, those particular products. Um, and then, um, oh, the, you know, the, the spatial question. You know, so that's the challenge with water sensors, right? That they're a point estimate. They give us this point measure, and we know there's lots of spatial variability out there. We try to put our sensors into representative areas in the field. We do have um, uh, two replicates you know, of that in the field, and so we do have a number of point measures in the field, and they're depth structured, so we are capturing a lot of information. But really, the way we're going about this is we're, we're not trying to make a spatial recommendation in a given field. What we're trying to do is get as many fields as possible. We learn from our statisticians. It's better to be on more farms than, than to have more uh, replicate measures within a farm. And so we can get more diverse climate and soil and management dynamics by just being on more farms and then link that up through the kinds of analysis that aggregates all of the kinds of data in the database. But as I mentioned earlier, we're also developing these things called these stress cams or the pheno cams, which integrate larger areas and they're super cheap. Once that technology is fully, um, you know, foolproof, we can put, you know, dozens of those across a field and capture lots of spatial information about water stress with an even cheaper technology, right? Right now it might take us a couple of thousand dollars to monitor a farm. We can capture more spatial information with these stress cams for the same price. Uh, and uh, because because they're only like fifty to one hundred dollars uh, an installation, and so you can capture a lot more spatial variability. So we're very focused on linking up scales. We know that you're going to have to have to have the hard measures like a point estimate with a, with a moisture sensor, but then we're going to scale that up using these stress cams or using various different remote sensing and satellite you know imagery types of approaches. And so that's a big part of what our team is doing is calibrating across scales and working across these, these different disciplinary strengths so that we can determine one, what's economical and two, um, build inference from the more precision point measures. Excellent. I got another question here from uh, Nick. Are you studying carbon sequestration and other potential climate change impacts of cover crops? Yeah, so, you know, we, I mean, we're a team that's all about soil health, right? You know, we're big believers and supporters of, of, of the initiative and, and all the momentum in the U.S. But what we thought, you know, for us, a better investment of our time is to focus on short-term dynamics. It's really hard to manage long-term dynamics on farm, let alone on a research station. So all of our measures are really around practices that we know have long-term implications like increasing carbon storage and, and um, improving soil health, but that monitoring, what is the, the short-term 
uh, barriers to getting broad scale adoption of these types of practices. And so for us, that's you know water, nitrogen, weeds, insects, disease, slugs. Um, but we are also working with um, uh, landscape modeling groups like uh, Dagan, who are building, um, uh, um, who are collaborating with the ecosystem service marketplace. That's you know working with consumer companies to provide recommendations around carbon footprints and, and carbon storage. And so they're using the DNDC model, which is um, a, land, a field level calculator. And so we have collaborations with them where you know we're using our data to calibrate some of their models and tools to get better recommendations around carbon footprints and greenhouse gas potential. Thank you, Stephen. Awesome. We are getting at the, we're at 430 now. Um, I think there's a couple more, I see another question come in. I just want to be respectful. Uh, the, the seminar goes till, till five. Oh, well then by all means, keep your questions coming. Uh, let's don't let Dr. Mursky off easy. Um, so the next question here, do you want to read it off there? Or do you want me to read it off to you? It's, a, it's uh, from Mary Brackey. Sure, I got it. Is All anyone right. looking at the effect of farmer access to detailed performance data of their farm, as well as neighboring farms on attitudes towards use of cover crops? Oh, gosh, Mary, that's a great question. Um, I think my short answer is yes. Um, my, my longer answer is, you know, we have, a, we have a, a, a very strong social science team that is fully enmeshed in all aspects of the project. From the, the data that we collect on farm, to the communication we have with farmers, to how that's affecting behavior and, and attitudes towards cover crops. And so that's certainly going to be one of the outcomes of the project, but there is already a fairly rich uh, literature on um, what drives decision making around cover crop adoption, but um, so what, you know the, what we're looking at is saying, hey, you got a farmer out in the field, they're looking, they've got these side by side with and without cover crops. Most of these are cover crop practitioners, but if they walk out in the field and they're like, you know, that part of the field looks a little bit more water stressed than this part of the field, is that because I got a net increase in water infiltration and storage from the cover crop? Oh, I could go look down on my phone in my app and say, oh yeah, I do have a greater water infiltration and storage in those cover crop strips. Or no, I don't, and I'm just seeing things or whatever it might be. So that's kind of part of that co-learning that's going on is that the farmers are seeing their data in real time, right? That's a big goal of ours, is that as soon as data comes in as rapidly as possible, that go data goes out on data dashboards that farmers can see and access. But we are not providing farmers with access to other farmers' data, and everything is anonymous in, in that respect. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Axel, go ahead. Oh, no, that's fine. Uh, Stephen, um, thank you very much for your talk. It's actually very, very, very interesting. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on the soil moisture question. Uh, are you hearing me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, okay. I understand that uh, Microsoft has a pretty big project working with, uh, you know, I guess they are using uh, artificial intelligence or something like that to come up with, you know, algorithms uh, to resolve some issues with soil moisture, you know, in, uh, at the special scale, uh, at the large scale, especially speaking. Uh, are you guys collaborating with them or something like that? Yeah, so um, I, I think what you're referring to, Axel, is is that Microsoft has recently developed a product called FarmBeats. Yes. Uh, and and you can see that like Microsoft is a collaborator on this yes. uh, acknowledgement slide. So so they developed a, a product called FarmBeats, and um, uh, my lab at the, the same Lag Systems Lab that I'm a part of um, at the Beltsville site, and uh, Chris Rivard Horton at uh, NC State, and, 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 and a lot of our Co colleagues at both of those locations have been partnering with um, Farm Beats before it went uh, live, and and so they did some prototyping and testing of it on our research station. Both kind of their um, their technology that incre increases um, access, uh, I mean, increases um, data transmittance. You know, so we have issues of of uh, um, connectivity in rural America, and so they're developing you know some solutions around that. Uh, but they're also developing a whole integrated you know software system that you know is trying to aggregate data from farms and do a lot of the different types of analysis you mentioned, including AI applications. Um, so we are collaborating with them in, in a number of ways. Um, they are developing um, algorithms to estimate um, biomass on the surface using synthetic data. And, and so we've been doing some comparing, comparing and contrasting of 
of the models that you know we get from our data sets uh, from what they're getting with theirs and so but we collaborate with other technology companies as well and you know our because our data is publicly available um, so that's just one of the tech companies that we're collaborating with right and uh if i could just a very general question um uh, it looks like uh you and scotty have a pretty good uh, relationship going on some years um, and I wonder why you guys uh, don't have yet a collaboration because in this part of the world here in Minnesota, working with cover crops is just a whole different thing. This is a consistent joke that we have. I <laughs> told him I would do the work for free and uh, send him all the data if he never asked me to go to a, uh, like a meeting or write a report. <laughs> so uh, he, they, I was approached. I was sick during the time and had to step back from it. But we're still game to do the collaborations. We actually are going to leverage our LCCMR project, to provide them the data. We already provided them a huge amount of data on some of the uh, rye modeling work as well. So okay. that's right. we're just, he just didn't really know where Minnesota was on the map. So you gotta take it easy <laughs> on these these federal guys. Yeah, no, that's true. No, I, I, I wish right. uh, you, heard, you could have come, yeah. No, we do, we, we, have, a, we have a standing open invitation uh, to Dr. Yeah, well, next through. time, yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank, thank you very much. I asked but for I all the stuff, he hasn't given it to me yet. I told him I'd pay for all of it. He just, I don't know, I think Dr. Mursky just doesn't like Minnesota dollars is the only thing I can do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are, we are collaborating with, uh, um, with uh, Nancy. Uh, we have a, you know, a national cover crop breeding network, so you can see Minnesota is on here. Right, it's mm -hmm. cover crop breeding network. So we I didn't see it actually. Yeah, so we are doing a lot of cover crop breeding. Oh, with, yeah, um, yeah, you, you have it here, but uh, you don't have it in your map actually, we you know. Right, because you can see they're in the cover crop breeding bracket here. Okay. So we we, we got to get them in the everything bracket. All right. <laughs> Even if I could follow up on that a little bit, if it's okay, Scotty. By all means, Don. So, uh, Scotty, this is uh, Don Wise uh, speaking. Um, you know, I was part of the cover crop thinking in the Midwest, you know, for the last, you know, 40, 50 years and was part of the group that started the Midwest Cover Crop Council. And um, as you well know, we haven't made much progress in the Midwest. So this for me is about the third cycle of a focus on, on, on cover crops. So as part of that, as you are probably well aware, we initiated the Forever Green initiative here at the University of Minnesota to bring along the next generation of germplasm. And uh, your interaction with Nancy is part of that philosophy here in Minnesota. And uh, it, just as I was sitting here listening to it, you know, what you laid out, the network of activity is just outstanding. I mean, it's just great. And when I was just thinking in terms of this network, <laughs> and you did say this, that it was built beyond just cover crops, right? And I, and I certainly understand that, right? But I think he would be really, really excited uh, to build a stronger working relationship between the work that you're doing and the Forever Green initiative that is now playing out here in the Midwest because it's pretty clear to most of us that based on the old technology, those cover crops that you described, that old technology is not going to pull us to where we need to be in the future. So I would just love to have you think about this model and the network of activities that you are developing and how that can play out across the country and to look at this other group right, the, your cover crop breeding and beyond, and helping build that core capacity to bring more germplasm technology into your framework of landscape change. And I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to pull these pieces together in a really robust way. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the sentiment, uh, you know, I, I, we've been watching uh, from afar, and, and I, I certainly am in close communication with Scotty and, and Nick Jordan, uh, and, and so watching, you know, uh, your group and, and all the different efforts that you're doing in that movement, and so it's been pretty inspiring to see what you all have put together, and, and these are conversations we've had, uh, both uh, Nick, Scotty, and myself independently on, um, you know, how we might be able to 
develop some alliances because there's they're, they're both supporting key ambitions, right? I mean, we're we're both interested in this GEMS approach of, of focusing on climate, soil management, and genetics. Yeah, I'm, on, I'm an old uh, guy, but but I'm I'm now convinced that if we don't have a new set of germplasm to incorporate on that landscape, uh, we're not going. At least here in the Midwest, I can't talk about the East Coast, but in the Midwest, we're not going to make much progress. And so you've laid out the way to, to manage that information, to get the best information, but I still believe we, we need to have a, a new set of germplasm, whether it's the major crops, the cover crops, to really design the agricultural systems to create this change, uh, in, at least in the Midwest. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and so we're, we're very motivated around this. I mean, as I, as I said before, uh, you know, we have a lot of momentum around cover crops and we're passionate about cover crops. We are certainly not naive to think that that is the solution or, or it is a solution. It's just one of the tools in the toolbox and we're deeply committed to, to, to partner. But as you well know looking. that those, those, those cover crops that you're mentioning, that is really, really old technology. Sure. Um, but you can see here there also, been, there, has, there hasn't been, there's been just very little investment in the development of that germplasm, at least in my career. Right. So, I, I, I agree with that. And if you, you see the, 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 if you can see the new image that I put up on the slide is this was just an appendix slide that I had. This is the National Cover Crop Breeding Network. And so we're a highly coordinated. So this is just another network that, that I'm involved with that, that um, and Nancy, your location is involved with where, and, and we're partnering with the plant material centers that you can see the NRCS raindrops across the country. Yeah, I understand. All I'm saying is that that ought to be quadrupled, <laughs> quadrupled, <laughs> right? That's all. That's my, my, my only. I argument. agree. And, I it agree. Is, and it historically has been the most underinvested area in, in the development of this landscape change, in my, in my opinion. The work that you're doing and putting the technology together, there's a huge investment in that from a wide range of companies, but the, the investment in germplasm development, I think has really been weak. Yeah. Not just from you, I mean, for all of us, right? Sure. Yeah. No, I concur. One other question I had for you, if I might. Come on, we're gonna have to cut you off, man. You only get one question, you know. Who, who is in charge of quality control? You have all of this data coming in from all these different sources. Who is in charge of quality control of that data? Okay. Well, so, um, you know, that's been an evolution uh, over time, uh, you know, really kind of the, the, the brain trust and that, 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 let, that kind of pioneered a lot of that effort is, you know, Chris River Corton at NC State, uh, but uh, one of the uh, data scientists in, in my lab, uh, Brian Davis, has really kind of matured through the program to become kind of our lead data engineer. So we're kind of quickly leaning on him to be kind of the key data engineer. And so a lot of the the, the flow that you're seeing, you know, it's, it's, it's a big part of what he's doing. It's part of what Chris has led, but, but we have, I mean, we have many committees, right? So we have an entire data flow committee that's committed to this, right? So we have lots of engineers, to, you know, technicians, other scientists uh, like Harry Schomburg at, uh, at uh, uh, in the Sustainable Life Systems Lab in Biltzell, Maryland, all meeting bi-weekly, it was weekly for a while there, to carve out all of this data flow and engineering solutions. And so it's really, I mean, I, it's not one individual, like certainly, you know, Brian Davis now is the, the head of data engineering, but um, this is just an incredible team effort, right? We're over 110 scientists in the network, and, awesome. and, and these data flow team meetings might have sometimes 10 to 20 people on a call, you know, informing how we want to deal with the data, informing quality controls. But, and also a big exciting part for us, uh, Don, has just been bringing in the new talent. You know, I mean, I, the irony now is I'm not hiring a lot of biologists these days. I'm hiring computer scientists and data engineers. I can see on the call right now, for example, um, a computer scientist, uh, Kade, is on the, uh, uh, one of the participant lists. And he's, uh, he's one of the new computer scientists at Engine Group and has extensive background in you know, robotics and software and hardware solutions. And so that's a big part of it for us now is, is that, you know, we have to bring in that talent and, and think outside of the box. And none of this is going to happen in a single disciplinary team. It's going to be transdisciplinary. I think you guys are laying out the model for the future. You know, it's what I wanted to say to you. And, um, and we would certainly all like to uh, stay engaged, stay in contact. And, and, and again, I just wanted to bring out the idea that 
germplasm development, not just for cover crops, but in terms of breeding cover crops and crops for this kind of type of new landscape cover uh, is something that I think uh, shouldn't be left off, too far off the table. And you haven't, right? But all I'm saying is I think it need, needs to have a greater set of investment across the, uh, the U.S. So we got uh, time for a few, couple more questions here. Thank you, Don. Um, I, I was thinking of the question here, uh, Nick, I'm gonna skip you and come back because I, I think I was curious about Mary's question as well. Um, you got all this technology, we're, we're looking, moving forward and it's not the, um, you know, what courses, what kind of technologies do our new students need? And you can read her, her question there. I think she frames yeah, it a bit better. It. Like, what do you need? I mean, I was thinking the whole time here thinking like what courses should I'd be advising my graduate students and undergrads to take to be able to participate in the Ag 5.0, whatever the next thing that comes from your your this this kind of network that you're building, you know, your team's building. This is this is a question I love. It's one that I'm quite passionate about, and I, I think that uh, it's it's something that we didn't anticipate. You know, it's like you go apart, you go, you know, you, you start small with something and it snowballs and you don't, before you know it, you're in the middle of something that you didn't even realize the synergies that are possible. And now it just seems endless. And so the community of practice is everything, right? Creating a culture and a community of practice really drives the dynamic, right? You know, so like encouraging our postdocs and our PhD students and graduate, you know, master's students to engage the network in specific ways, forcing them to really, you know, you know, go outside of their comfort box, both from a disciplinary perspective, but also from a social perspective, is a big part of creating these future scientists, right? Is we, we need folks to be able to work in teams. We need to be able to do coordinated science. It's exhausting. It's, you know, 99% of my time is dealt with, you know, being a cheerleader and communicating, you know, to folks and coordinating. It's not, I don't do that much science as much as I'd like to do because I'm more, you know, helping to continue to glue networks together. And so that it's, it's, it's enormously um, challenging to do, but that's the future of developing these solutions. We can't work alone. We can't, you know, carve out these two, three year projects and think we're going to really hit the big issues of the day. You know, it's like, you know, we've got this grand challenge to feed the world and to do it in the face of these destabilizing factors. And for us, what we found is that requires coordinated science. And, and so for us, that means that we're embedding computer scientists and engineers and programmers into a lab with agronomists and soil scientists and weed scientists. And we think that one of the reasons we've been really successful is, is, is it's not just a bunch of engineers saying, hey, you guys need this and this is how it works and you should do this and we know what you need. And it's not a bunch of agronomists saying, you know, um, you know come engineering it on their own. It's the agronomists saying, hey, this is what we need and, and, and working in the trench every step of the way with the engineer and co-conceiving of the solution. And so it's that collective working in together really makes the difference. And so some of the folks who come into the lab, they may not be really motivated to become programmers, but they're learning how sensor technology works. They're learning how to deal with different data streams. They're learning how to do the analytics. They're learning how to enter a database and, and pull things from a database. And so, you know, there's no question the future of our science is going to be some, you know, interdisciplinary training in, you know, AI, you know, machine vision and learning, you know, some levels of computer science and, and, um, and our traditional sciences. And I, I don't think that it's going to happen overnight, but the reality of it is, is that um, just like when we, when mixed models came out in SAS, right? Everybody's like, how do you do a mixed effect model? Why should we be doing mixed effect models? Now everybody does mixed effects models. Like it's like, you know, part of like the curriculum that every single person who comes out of grad school must know how to do a mixed effect model, right? Well, I think that's going to be the future of AI in agriculture is that everybody's going to be using it. Not everybody's going to be an AI developer. A lot of people will be an AI user, uh, but um, in, embedding teams with, you know, dif disciplinary strengths and working in these coordinated networks um, it's where it creates the synergies. Because you know that the PIs like us, the, the, the faculty, the scientists, we're often don't have enough time to give those individual uh, graduate students what they need to develop those well-rounded well skills. So when you create a community 
of postdocs and graduate students that have those disciplinary strength skills. There's so much um, synergy that they're developing at the bench at the grassroots level. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, we've got five more minutes. So if you've got any burning questions, you can uh, put them in the chat or I think Cody can activate your microphone if you'd like to go that route. Well, Stephen, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the department. You gave a phenomenal lecture and uh, um, I'm really excited to see what comes out of this program 